Sorry to disappoint you. All right. Let's go ahead and it's 10 o'clock. We'll open up in prayer. Brother Barry, would you open us up, please? Thank you. All right, so we're back in Romans chapter 13. We left off. Um, thank you, Brother Sam, for standing in for me last week. Heard he did a good job. I don't think he's here this morning. Um, but I uh, appreciate that. And I believe he announced his call to preach. So that's uh, another blessing. So that's good. But let's get back into the text here, Romans chapter 13. Remember, we're talking about authority. Uh, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we started talking about the authority that's given down to Satan and he's prince of power of the air and over the children of disobedience and all those things. We ran you back to Job and kind of showing you some of that stuff and how that, that deception that's going to take place in the tribulation. You'll see that the Antichrist shows up doing signs, wonders, and miracles and he's given that power and authority from God. Okay, so the whole chapter, once again, Paul's dealing with authority, which is never a popular chapter to teach or preach on. But it nevertheless is in the Bible, and notice it's in Romans chapter 13. What's the number of rebellion? 13, right? Let's look back at Genesis 13, 13. Genesis 13, 13, you'll see this word show up for the first time. Look at Genesis 13, 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So you see that 13 right there. That first time that word sinners ever shows up is right there in Genesis 13, 13. And who's the 13th from Adam? It's the type of the Antichrist. Nimrod. All right. Now look down at uh, Genesis 14, 4. Genesis 14, 4. Twelve years they served in... Uh, Kedar Leomar, that's one of them Hebrew words, and in the 13th year, what's it say? They rebelled. So you see how number 13 is the number of rebellion, and it's also connected with sinners. All right, and so I hate to tell you this, but how many colonies did we have when we started out? 13. How many Confederate states? 13. Are you seeing a pattern? Okay, um, so much to the point, uh, John Wesley, who who doesn't know who John Wesley is? And if you do, raise your hand. He was the founder of the Methodist Church, right? Great soul winner, although he was Armenian and believed you could lose it. But he's won over a million people to Christ. What have you done? All right, so before you start judging him, uh, understand he was a great soul winner. And John Wesley actually rebuked the founding fathers when they uh, broke away from England, and he rebuked them for that. Why did he do that? Well, because right here, Romans 13 because our authority is handed down from God. Now, that's not a popular thing to tell Americans because we are naturally by nature rebellious, right? Because that's how our country was founded. But, right, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Severness is as the sin of idolatry. So you have to separate the two. You have to separate the holy from the profane. And I thank God that, you know, we live in the greatest country on earth and all that. And I've served my country for 24 years, I did, and, and all that. But you have to separate... Are you a Christian or are you an American? Because when you get into these passages, you're going to really have to dig deep and say, well, what's the, what's the book say? All right? So with that being said, let's look at the text again. Let every soul, notice that, let every soul, not just saved, but lost as well, be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whether you like them or not, God put them in power. He's the one who set them there. And so we went back back over to the Psalms and some of those passages showing you how that the Lord, and you'll see it in the book of Judges, uh, because they left off the word of God. They left it, they, every man did which, that which is right in his own eyes. There was no king in the land. There was no authority. So kind of men were doing whatever they felt like doing. So God and, and, and the nation of Israel went into apostasy very quickly after Joshua dies. And he begins sending them judges, and they would get right for a little bit. And then as soon as that judge would die, they'd go right back into apostasy. Okay, if they didn't have any sort of authority and kind of somebody to keep them in line, 
They would go right back into apostasy, and as a great type of your flesh, okay, which is important. I mean, this is this is why you need the book. This is why you need church. This is why you need a pastor, because your flesh is going to want to do evil things. That's just it's inherently evil. It's not. It's there's nothing good about your flesh. Okay, if I, if you left it alone for any uh, amount of time, it wants to go do the wrong things. All right, if you ever you, you have little children. All right, I remember when I was a a young child, and I lived out in Los Angeles, California. There's a lot of Hispanics out there. And uh, what's the first thing you want to learn from another language? Dirty words. Curse words. Man is wise to do evil. Right? I mean, you say, well, not me. Okay, well, you might be more spiritual than me, but that's what I wanted to learn. Because that's, that's in your flesh. That's your Adamic nature. So you, you have to always keep that in mind. Um, the power, but but you, that your your flesh is no good, and it always wants to do bad. This is why you must be born again. You've got to have the divine nature, because if without the divine nature, you're going to do evil. Okay. All right. So let's look at it again. But the powers are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So the way of transgressors is hard, isn't it? All right. If you want to have a hard life. Be a transgressor. All right? But notice that. Uh, uh, therefore, the resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, let's look at that. That word damnation. Am I on? Yes. You've got to look at the context, what he's talking about. Are we talking about temporal or eternal damnation? Well, for a believer, it would be temporal. Okay, you're going to receive the recompense reward. Okay, if you do bad, you're going to receive bad for that. All right, but your damnation is talking about temporal damnation. Look at look at Romans eight. Romans eight, verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Okay, but if you walk after the flesh and you fulfill the lust of the flesh, you put yourself back under that law. And Romans 8, 13, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Okay, but that's not eternal damnation. That's temporal damnation. Okay, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go there. So when you read these things, you've got to put these things in context of what Paul is talking about. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is concerning taking the Lord's Supper. Not concerning the Lord's body. Look at Romans 11 verse... Let's look at verse 26. For as oft, often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do shew the, the Lord's death till He come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh him, uh, damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Notice this, verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. All right, so what kind of damnation is he talking about? Now these are saved people. Is that temporal or, or is that eternal? All right, it's temporal. All right, so he's, notice he says... Many, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What's the sleeping concerning? What's that talking about? Dead. Okay, they're dead in Christ. Like literally, they got taken out. The Lord said, I'm done with you. That's the first apostolic church. Let's get back to the first apostolic church. You sure you want to go there? Are you sure you want to go there? It'd be dropping dead left and right. Okay, so you have to understand and discern between what's he talking about? Damnation he's talking about here is temporal for the believer. Okay? Now if they're unsaved and they do wrong and they continue to do wrong and they get whacked, guess what? They, if they're unsaved, then that would be eternal. Okay? So, but you have to discern when he's talking about damnation or condemnation, you have to discern from the context what's he talking about. Okay? So if you're in Christ, do you die in your sins? Can you die in your sins if you're in Christ? No. Why not? Because you're in Christ. Okay? You might commit sins, and you might be taken out early because of those sins, but you can't die in your sins because you're in Christ. You're justified from all things. 
So this is, this is why I say this is so important to understand the old man and the new man, sonship, fellowship, all those basic foundational things that Paul's laid down in his epistles, you have to get those things straight and, uh, and understand those before you move on to the next step. Because if not, these are verses that you could look at and say, well, I can lose my salvation. Not understand that simple principle. Okay, who's ever had struggles with that if, if you've been re reading your Bible? I'm sure there's a lot of folks in here that it's confusing if you don't understand those two, those, that principle. Okay? All right, let's go back to Romans 13. All right, so whosoever resisteth, that they that resist shall receive in themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror of good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. All right? So rulers are a terror, are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Even these evil rulers, um, there's still law and order in their countries. Okay, no, no ruler wants complete anarchy. It's like herding a bunch of cats. You ever try to herd a bunch of cats? Can't do it, right? It ain't going to happen. So there's got to be some sort of order and discipline, or you cannot rule that congregation, that, that group, whatever that is. Uh, if a pastor has envy, strife, and division within his church, uh, can he pastor that church? No, because it's chaos. Every man's doing that which is right in his own eyes. So let all things be done decently and in what? In order. Okay, so anytime you see things that are not being done decently and in order, the Lord's not in that thing. Okay, he's not in that thing. All right. So let's go back to the text. He says, Will thou not be? Uh, be afraid of the power, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if, if thou do that which is evil, be, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So, your law enforcement, they're ministers of God. That's what it says in the text. Okay, they're ministers to God. They're there to execute wrath. So the the president is the executive branch, and his job is to execute the laws that are in the Constitution. All right, we have a legislative and judicial branch. We all, and this isn't a civics class, but you understand that those laws are, are, once those things are put into law, it is that president's duty, whoever that you elect, to execute those laws. And if they fail to execute those laws, you have anarchy. All right? So that is their job. That is the executive branch. So he's to execute wrath upon them that do evil. I just saw a thing the other day. Um, TBI was reporting how, how many of these uh, Venezuelan gangs are now in Knoxville, and Nashville, and Memphis, and Chattanooga are major cities in Tennessee. And they're, they're being allowed to stay in here because the federal government versus state government, and they're, they're having a war within themselves, and so they can't even arrest these Venezuelan gangs. Well, the only thing they can do is watch them. All right? Because ICE has retainers and all this other legal jargon. But that's probably going to change here real quickly. Right? Because the president's job is to execute the laws appointed. Okay? So when that takes place, you're going to see a whole lot of things change and there's going to be peace. Because that's his job. That's his number one is to keep you safe. And that's the military's job. Okay, when I was in the Marine Corps, we were to execute whatever the president told. He's the commander-in-chief, right? So whatever he said, that's what we did. He's the general of the army. You don't get to argue with him. Okay, you don't say, well, my rights. Say, no, you don't have rights. You go here, you do this, you do what you're told. Okay, you execute the plan that, that you've been given. And so that was, that was our job, and it was to execute whatever the executive branch said. All right, so that those those powers are handed down from God, okay, and it's to execute wrath. All right, when I was in law enforcement, um, I would ask you, I would tell you, and then I would move you. Okay, that's you, you ask nicely, sir. Please move over here. Okay, sir, move over here. All right, you don't want to move. I'm going to move you myself. All right, anybody had an unruly child? You can raise your hands. All right. I know you have because they're children. They're, they got Adam all in them, all right? And they can get unruly, can't they? You know, come here. Don't do this. Don't do that. And then what do they do? They keep doing it. And then what do you have to do? You got to execute wrath. And you got to 
put your hands on them and so that they don't do that anymore and they understand that I will come down and beat you with a rod. Not in the you know, sense of, of abuse, but as the Bible says, all right? And so you're trying to keep that kid from evil. And so those things, those powers of God are given to us, that given down from God. And those ministers of God, the law enforcement in this country executes wrath and they're ministers of God. Keep you safe. Now, I've been out street preaching. This is where you have to separate the holy from the profane. I've been out street preaching and an officer come up and say, hey, you got, y'all need to move on down the road. Well, because the reason why is because, like, for instance, sometimes they have little events at Market Square and they might pay for that venue, okay, and so they have a permit to be there. Well, they don't want somebody standing across and yelling at them about, the, you know, they're sinners and all that kind of stuff. And so the law enforcement comes up and says, hey, y'all need to move. And I've had some, some individuals where they want to argue with the police. Wrong answer. Well, my rights. Shut up about your rights. You, you see Peter, James, and John? You see them talking about their rights? No, they took a beating. They got thrown in prison. But they weren't out here stand, standing here talking about their rights. So you've got to use some, some common sense. And so if people have something paid for and the cops tell you to move, they just move. i got better things to do on a Saturday night anyway. I'll go down to another street corner. It's not a big deal. Okay? And then it turns into the whole deal where, you know, well, freedom of speech and so on and so forth. Well, the city has ordinances. And the city has noise ordinances. And one of those noise, they used to anyway, one of the ordinances is that you couldn't use voice amplification. You couldn't use an amplifier to make your voice louder. Okay? And so, some individuals show up and they did it against what the ordinance was. And they got a ticket and showed up and they had to go to court for it. Okay, those things happen. And then they say, well, I was being persecuted for preaching the gospel. No, you were being persecuted for being stupid. You've got to have some common sense. Some of the brethren get out here and they got this Paul complex and they feel like they're, you know, oh, look at me, I took a stand for God. No, you were stupid. You were suffering as, evil, as an evildoer. Amen? And, and, and you get a lot of young guys out there, they want to go prove something. No, what you're doing is you're resisting the power. Okay, look at 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. And, you know, I, and I told him, I said, listen, if, if, if I told you to do something, I said, I carried a badge for a living. If I told you to do something and you didn't do it, well, you're going to be on your face. That's just how it is. Because you, you can't be sitting there taking a bunch of grief from people when you are to execute the laws. All right, look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Why? For the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Here you go again. And for the praise of them that do well. Same, see, Paul and Peter are talking about the same thing. For so, here we go, for so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness but as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the king. Is that direct enough? This is the will of God for your testimony. You don't go out there and act a fool and then, and then tell everybody you're, you're a Christian because that's a bad testimony. Is it not? Uh, let's see here. Yeah, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Who is the king at this time? Well, Caesar. And which Caesar? Nero. So you a good king or bad king? Horrible, right? Here's Peter saying... Honor the king. Why? Because the powers that be were ordained of God. He was mature by that point. When Peter writes that, he was a whole lot mature than he was in the garden, wasn't he? Yeah. When he was cutting Malchus's ear off, he learned a few things, didn't he? Yeah. To submit. Right. That's easier said than done. Amen. Why? Because you have an Adamic nature. Right. You have a problem with authority. Where does that come from? Your mommy and daddy, Adam and Eve. That's where it started. Right? You've got to look, at, look back at Genesis chapter 3. You think man's changed any? Not one bit. He's got an Adamic nature. And even though you're born again, if you're, you're saved, you still have an Adamic nature. And you want to rebel against authority. Look at Genesis chapter 3. 
Uh, look at verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. So sin entered in, and now he's afraid. Sin will make you a coward. Okay? And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee to do, or that thou shouldest not eat? Now, did God already know what happened? Of course he did. What's he, he's given Adam a chance. Now watch his response. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me, or to be with me, she gave of me of the tree, and I did eat. Now what did he just do? He's the ultimate, now it's called gaslighting. Adam is a great politician, isn't he? He pivoted. That's called a red herring in, in philosophy. Okay, so he gets asked a direct question, and what's he do? Lord, the woman that thou gavest me, he's the accuser of the brethren, and he doesn't answer that question. He blames somebody else. That's what your flesh wants to do. You get in trouble for something, all right? What do you want automatically? You want mercy. You automatically say, well, it wasn't me. It wasn't my fault. I was born this way, so on and so forth. It wasn't my fault, you know. All that stuff, that's what your flesh wants to do. It hates authority. And what did, what did Satan attack right off the bat? The authority of what God said. It is that simple. It's that simple. So you, you had better be mindful of that in your own flesh to know that, listen, my flesh wants to do evil. I have an Adamic nature, and I better keep a check on it, I better keep a watch on it, or else it's going to go the wrong way. And I'm going to blame God, I'm going to blame this person, blame, instead of saying, it's me, Lord. Right? It's me. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So be mindful of that. All right, let's get back to the text in Romans 13. So those ministers of God are there to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. Verse 5, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. All right, so you've got a testimony, and you've got a conscience. All right, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to have a good testimony in front, of a lost, in front of the lost world. Okay, that's why you're doing it. Okay, you, you can be wrong, you can be right and be wrong. Okay, you can be 100% right in what you're doing and be wrong. You would abstain from all appearance of evil. If it casts a stumbling block before another believer, if it sheds bad light on Christianity, on your church, on your pastor, those kind of things. No man liveth and dieth unto himself. Okay, everything that you do has a ripple effect. It's going to affect somebody else. If we got somebody that was, uh, we've had some guys when I was overseas and got arrested overseas, Okay, for doing dumb things. Guess what it said on the front page news? A Marine did such and such. They didn't say John Jones. It said a Marine. Why? Because we represented something bigger than ourselves. Well, if a pastor or if a Christian or if a well-known well Christian gets in trouble, what does it say in the newspaper? A pastor did such and such. It doesn't say, you know, Randy Hall. It says a pastor so just keep that in mind before you open your big mouth and you do something, especially with social media nowadays. People get in all kind of trouble because they get on there and they feel like, I need to say something. Well, then you just need to hush. Okay? You just need to just, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. If you think, I'm going to get on here and make some, take, make some big statement, well, then it, it could get you in trouble. Just be mindful of that. Okay? All right, for conscience sake, look at verse 6. For this cause, for, for this cause, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. What's he saying? Let me look at it. What's he saying? He's saying this. Pay your taxes. Anybody like that verse? Nobody likes to pay taxes, do they? You like your military? You better pay your taxes. You like law enforcement? You better pay your taxes. You like roads? You better pay your taxes. Okay? Now that's not a popular verse either, right? Let's look at Matthew 17. Look what the Lord says. 
Matthew chapter 17. First, well, let's look at the whole passage. Matthew 17, 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they, had, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth your master pay tribute? Here's Peter. He saith yes. He don't even know the answer. He saith yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? And whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free? Notwithstanding, notice this, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast in hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. What did he say? Pay your taxes. Why? Lest we should offend them. Your testimony is more important than your tax money. All right, look at Matthew chapter 22. You know the passage? The Herodians come. Now, that's a group that was tied up in, in politics and religion. They were obviously uh, supporters of Herod. And, of course, they're asking him about tribute money. Look at verse 19. Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny, and he saith unto him, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. They had nothing else to say to him, did they? He said, Who's, who's, whose image is on that thing? We'll give it back to Caesar. All right, separate the holy from the profane. All right, so he's saying, pay your taxes lest we, we should offend them. Now here's something to think about. You got Joseph and Mary. You got it in the book of Luke. They were commanded to go up to be taxed. There's a census in the land. So everybody was to go back to the place of their lineage, their birth, right, that where they came from. So Judah goes back to Bethlehem, right? That's where David's born. All right, so they go back there. Now think about Joseph if he was rebellious and said, I'm not paying my taxes, I'm not going to that census. If he didn't submit himself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, think of what would have happened. He would have went against Scripture because that is the place that the Lord was to be born, Micah 5, 2. So because he submitted himself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, he went up to be taxed, he went back to Bethlehem, and that's where the Lord was born, and he fulfilled Scripture. See how all things work together for good? To them that love God, to them that who are thee called according to his purpose. It might not make sense when you're doing it. Until afterwards you look back and go, look at that. See how God worked that thing out? Joseph submitted himself under Caesar. All right. All right, let's go back to Romans 13. Romans 13. Let's look at... Verse 7, that render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. All right? You're to give honor to those that are above you, those in uh, higher uh, offices of authority, principalities and powers. All right, you think about the Lord himself. He's put far above all principalities and thrones and dominions, as it talks about in Ephesians 1. But who made the principalities, powers, thrones, dominions? All Who made those things? The Lord did. And when he was on this earth, what did he do? He submitted himself to those powers that he created. And you can't submit yourself? Is the servant greater than his master? Let all things be done without murmurings and disputings. It's off the quiet. You can't even submit yourself to a speed limit. Ever want to use it as a dirty, rotten scoundrel because you broke the speed limit getting here. I know John Jones. I've seen him drive. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Altar's open, folks. <laughs> See, this stuff ain't going to get you a lot of clicks on YouTube, but I'll tell you what, it's Bible. It's boring, right? It's base. It's, uh, it's boring. Yeah, well, guess what? You need it. You need it more than you think you do. I know I do. All right, go, let's go on here. Cuss to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. All right. Let's look at Titus. Look at Ch Titus chapter 2. Verse 
Once again, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. Titus chapter 3, sorry. That's what uh, Mark Twain said. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Obviously, he's talking to Titus. He's a pastor, just like Timothy. Put them in mind to be subject to the principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man. Oh, boy. That's a tough one, isn't it? To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, kind, at, that the kindness of, and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Here you go. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse um, 7. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So, you're to be subject to the principalities and powers. Higher powers. Just like Romans 13. That's what he's telling Titus. All right. Don't be, make, don't be making a fool of yourself. All right, look at uh, 1 Peter once again. You've got a high calling, right? Look at 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. You're different. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, in which war against the soul, having your conversation, that's your manner of living, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your, notice this, good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And then, once again, we already read verse 13. All right, so you're to have a good report of them that are without. Okay, if you're out here rioting in the daytime and doing things that walking as the Gentiles walk, then and guess what? You're not going to have a good report. You don't have a good testimony. And they say, if that's a Christian, I don't want anything to do with it. Y'all remember about four years ago, January 6th, that big rioting, things that were taking place up there in Washington, D.C.? What good did it do them? You shouldn't have been within a thousand miles of that place. I know preachers that went up there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right, wrong, or indifferent. Should a Christian be there? No. No. Stay away from it. Did it work out for good? Not for them, but guess what? Four years later, here we are. See all that? What good did it do them? Had another election? Okay, guys back in the White House. It worked itself out together for good, didn't it? Don't go anywhere near that bunch of nonsense. And certainly don't go out there with an S on your chest or a C saying you're a super Christian. Okay, and, and, and get thrown in jail. You're rioting in the daytime. Works of the flesh. All right. Enough on that. Let's go back to Romans 13. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything. Oh, man. But to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. We're not going to get into a big financial thing here, talking about that, you know, $35 trillion in debt in Americans. That's the biggest, one of the biggest sins, I guess, Americans commit. I think it's 106000 The average American owes $106,000, all right, in debt, all right? And of course, the more in debt you are, then the more you're going to have to serve whoever your, your loaner of money is. Okay, we understand that. But I want you to look at the theological look or the, the practical thing here. Look at Romans chapter 1. Look at Paul says... He says, owe no man anything but to love one another. Look at Romans 1 says. Romans 1, 14. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He had a debt to pay that he couldn't owe, but he tried. And that was to love one another. That's what you can do for your fellow Christian. All right. Notice what he says. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. So if you're walking in the spirit, not in the, not in the flesh, you're, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right? The lust of the flesh are mani manifest, or the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. All right? Galatians chapter 5, you'll notice that all those works of the flesh, they all have to do with self. All right? So we're going to look at the greatest commandment, right? Look at Matthew 22 again. 
because he's going to talk about this. Look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Well, verse 36, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, which Paul will quote, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All right? So, who have we got first? Jesus first. Right? Others second. There's your neighbor. And then yourself last. See the joy? Acronym joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. If you put Jesus first, are you going to commit adultery, fornication, murder, debate, all that stuff, works of the flesh? If you put others second, put him first, others second, are you going to cast a stumbling block before your neighbor? Are you going to do something in front of a weaker Christian that's going to make them stumble? No, you're not. See how you fulfill the law? It's that simple. In, the, in a general sense, in the spirit of the law, what he's talking about. Okay, let's look at Galatians 5 again. Galatians chapter 5, look at it quickly. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? All these things are selfishness. Adultery. All right, if you love the Lord, are you going to commit adultery? Joseph didn't. Joseph ran, didn't he? He said, flee youthful, youthful lusts. That's what Joseph did. Why? Because he put the Lord first. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. What's your biggest idol? Yourself. Covetousness, which is idolatry. That's your biggest idol is yourself. Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations. You're to love the brethren, are you not? Well, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. That's what he said in 1 John. Wrath, strife, seditions. What's a sedition? Overthrowing governments. It's work of the flesh. Heresies. You mean Christians can, can uh, commit heresy? You better believe it. Envyings. Most of them think I'm a heretic. Uh, envyings. Murders. Drunkenness. Revelings. What's that? Big old parties. Like down there at the stadium. That's what it is, folks. That's a reveling. Amen. All right, so all those things are, have to do with selfishness. That's you putting yourself first. I'm going to do it. I, I've got liberty. I'm going to do what I want to do. Yeah, but it's not convenient. It's not going to edify. Okay? You've got to be careful about that thing. Look, at, look back at 13. 13.9 for this. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in these sayings, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. See, if you put Jesus first, others second, yourself last, you won't have to worry about walking in the flesh. You walk in the Spirit. Okay? You yield yourself unto God, all right? You're going to walk in the Spirit. You yield yourself to the flesh, you'll walk in that flesh. Okay, you'll, you'll commit the works of the flesh. Even a saved person. You better believe a saved person. Okay? Now look at that thing there. I want you to notice one quick, quick note about Romans 13, 9. Does anybody notice a commandment that's left out? Other than Brother Barry? Anybody notice a commandment that's not in there? Sabbath. What's that have to do with? Israel. Do you have to keep the Sabbath? No. Not for salvation. If you want to keep it, keep it. But it's not for salvation. So you've got Seven Day Adventists going out there saying you've got to keep the Sabbath. You've got to keep that ceremonial law. You've got others going out there saying you've got to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and Passover and Feast of Weeks and all that kind of stuff. Trying to put you back under the law. That's Galatianism. You've got to watch out for that thing. Notice how Paul specifically leaves that thing out because that's a sign between God and Israel. Okay? Between that nation. Okay, there's, there's certain things that uh, Paul leaves out on purpose. Anybody ever dealt with those, any of those groups? 
They say you have to keep the Sabbath and that kind of stuff. When was the Sabbath revealed? Did Adam keep the Sabbath? No, he didn't. When was it revealed? Under, under the law, right? All right, I think it's Ezekiel 20. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 20. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. Well, verse 11, and I get, well, look at verse 10, there's a paragraph mark. Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness, and I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths, notice this, to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. So who is the Sabbath for? That Jew when they're under the law, all right? So that, that, um, that changes some things a bit over there and you get in the tribulation. That's why he says that, uh, pray that, pray not that your flight be on the Sabbath day in Matthew 24, because you've got a nation back under that law. But right now, the body is of Christ. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in meat or in respect of a holy, do, holy, uh, holy day or new moon or Sabbath days. For these are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. We'll get into that in Colossians. But don't ever have somebody come up to you and say, well, you've got to keep the Sabbath. Now, if, when I get into Romans 14, we'll talk about the Puritans a little bit and how, how they did things when they first came here as the pilgrims. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll deal with that when we get there. But he leaves that out for a reason because that's a sign between God and Israel. No need to keep the Sabbath. Okay, anything wrong with the Sabbath? No, just don't try to think that you need to keep it for salvation because there's some that do. All right, we'll leave it there. All right, Father, Lord God, we just thank you, Lord, for this uh, time we've had together once again. We thank you for your word. We thank you for those in attendance today, Lord, and just pray for our service this morning. Pray for Brother Barry as he leads the choir and our pastor as he breaks the bread of life one more time. And Father, we just thank you. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right.